some thoughts with you around this topic of uh, food security and climate change. So this is the outline of my talk. I'm going to start by giving you a little uh, introduction about CCAS, the CGR Research Program on Climate Change, Agriculture, and Food Security, so you can get a context of what we do. And then a little introduction in terms of this big challenge of uh, reducing risks to food security because of climate change. I'm going to follow with some knowledge limitations in order to really start working on, the, uh, on assessing the impacts of climate change and variability on food security, a little bit of the impacts themselves, how are we seeing this story from the science, and then I think that this is going to be the more interesting part of my talk, which, um, which discusses four challenges in order to move to an action agenda to reduce the risk of uh, climate change and food security, and they, um, finally the conclusion. So a little bit about CCAS. Again, CCAS is this CGR research program on climate change, agriculture, and food security. This is a global research program. We work on five different regions of the world. Latin America is one of those. I lead the Latin American section of CCAS. It's an alliance between the CGR and Future Earth. So CGR very concerned with uh, generating knowledge around agriculture, and then the Future Earth very much on generating knowledge about environmental change, atmosphere processes, and that. So it's a really nice combination to do research on climate change, agriculture, and food security. What is our, what's CCAS vision? So how do we see ourselves? First of all, let me say that uh, the, in the heart of our theory of change is the work with partners. So partnerships are key to achieve what CCAS intends to achieve. So basically, what we want to be is that with the help of our farmers, our collaborators and partners, become the foremost global source of collaborative research that can lead to strategies in order to help farmers to tackle food insecurity in the face of climate change and climate variability. So basically, that's what we intend to do with the research that we generate in CCAS. A little bit of a story of what's the relationship between this research program, and let me say that CCAS is just one of these research programs. In the CGR, we have many research programs, being the one on climate change, one of those. But what's the relationship between this research program and the research centers that are part of the CGR? So uh, basically what you see in here is that CGR has 15 different international research centers around the world. I am located in CIEF, in the International Center for Tropical Agriculture, but we have more of them focusing on different aspects of agriculture. So on, as I said, on tropical agriculture, we have also on rice, we have on livestock, we have on water, on fisheries, and, and so forth. So, but basically what we intend to do from the research programs, and specifically CCAS, is to um, get the science that it's being generated in these research centers, get the science from them and put it in the hands of our users. Could be either the, at, the, at the national level of, of government, at the local level, could be uh, the producers' organizations, could be the private sector, could be the, 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 the farmers. So basically, we are uh, bridging that gap between the science that is being generated in these research centers and the users so that this kind of science can be useful for various decision-making processes. So let's start on the topic. Just to give you some numbers in order to set up this scene. What's happening, and these are interesting and big numbers to have in mind whenever we are thinking about this challenge of, uh, of food security and climate change. So right now we have 1.4 billion of people living in poverty. So in here we are talking about billions. So these are big numbers. Nearly 
nearly one billion are going hungry. And then thinking about the future, which is, which is what we think when we uh, start discussing sorry, on climate change. So one billion more people by 2030. So we will have to feed one billion more people in 20 years. And 14% more food needed per decade. And then when, where is this food coming from? So what's happening in terms of our environmental services? One, we see that 1.5 billion people depend on degraded lands. So we have a huge challenge in here. And then let's see what's happening in terms of what we have been calling a uh, climate smart agriculture in terms of these challenges according to those numbers. So we are thinking about adaptation, food security, and mitigation. So in terms of adaptation, we have evidence that already, right now, yields are decreasing because of climate impact. So in this graph, what we can observe is for maize and wheat at the global level and then for different countries. And what you're observing there is that climate is generating decreases in these yields. So we need to adapt to what already is happening in terms of climate variability that is reducing these yields. So big challenge in terms of adaptation. We need to think about adaptation. And not in 20 years, but starting now. And then the other challenge in terms of food security, food and nutrition security issues. So what are we observing in here? For the year 2008, we are having 1.4 billion adults that are overweight. So that's a really important problem that is happening in terms of food security. And then 842 million people are undernourished. So among the adults, 35% of them are overweight and 29% of them suffer from micronutrient deficiency. But then, to make things worse, what's happening? That 98% of these people that are facing these problems are living outside of high-income countries. So are either in middle, low-income countries, and that makes them more vulnerable. And then the third challenge, thinking about mitigation. So mitigation is how, what we are doing to reduce the emission of greenhouse gases, which are the ones that are generating these changes in climate. So right now, agriculture is responsible for 75% of global deforestation. And you know that this is very linked to the emissions of greenhouse gases. <coughs> According to some studies, if these trends continue, this deforestation because of agriculture, then by 2050, about 10 million kilometer squares of land will be clear to meet food demand. Because remember that we will have to feed a lot more people than we have to feed right now. So 10 million kilometer squares of land clear. But there are good news. There are alternative pathways for instance, thinking about silvopastoral systems where you have trees and cattle in the same place that will require only two million kilometer squares of land to be cleared in order to meet food demand. So great challenge in terms of how are we going to do it. There are ways to do it, but we have to start thinking how to do this. And then, thinking again about mitigation and the relationship between emissions of greenhouse gases and agriculture. So this is a really interesting graph that is coming from the World Resource Institute. And then you have the emissions in here in terms of gigatons of CO2 equi equivalents. You have in yellow the non-agricultural emissions, emissions that are coming from other sectors. And then here in, I guess that this is green, you have agriculture and land use change emissions. So deforestation is also included in there. And then what, uh, what, what they did in this, this study is that they calculated these emissions for 2050 
in what we call business as usual. If nothing is done, if we continue the same trend, then we're going to have this proportion in terms of non-agricultural emissions, and this is in terms of agricultural land use change emissions. But then, let's think about targets. So remember that in the climate change negotiations, the agreement was that we could not afford that temperature would increase more than two degrees Celsius. So if we think about this target for 2050, if we meet that target, we are supposed that to only emit 21 gigatons of CO2 equivalents. If agriculture continues doing the same thing as we are doing right now, then in that new scenario, meeting this target, we're going agriculture and land use change is going to be responsible for more than 70% of the total emissions. So I guess that uh, an important message in here is that agriculture must do its part as well. We need to start changing the way that we are doing things in agriculture. So general challenges. Where are then the general challenges? Well, farmers are already dealing with changes in weather patterns, and we are observing rising in the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events. So this is happening now. This is not, we don't have to wait 20, 50, 100 years. This is happening now. And this is making farming even more risky. So that's a challenge that we, 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 we need to start doing something around that. And then, and I'm going to discuss this, this a little bit more, uh, but what we are observing is a gap between research, the research that is being generated around these topics, and the implementation. What are we going to do with those results in terms of the research? And, and this, uh, the challenge is greater. We think that there's an additional problem when dealing with climate change, and it's that we have to deal with deep uncertainties. And it is really hard to make decisions with deep uncertainties. So we need to find out and to discover tools and processes where uncertainty in knowledge can drive action. And I guess, and, 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 and this is the big message that I want to bring in here. We need to find a way to work with uncertainties so that we don't uh, stop and don't do anything. So we can generate action. So let's go in terms of what has what 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 has people been worried about about this knowledge generation around these topics about these knowledge limitations. So where do we have these knowledge li limitations that need to be overcome? So we have um, from the modeling side we have three problems right now, and let's start in terms thinking about climate models and how climate models are limiting food production impact studies. We want to know what's going to happen with food production, but then we have limits in terms of generating knowledge about the climate model. What you observe in this graph is uh, the, the, these are combinations of country seasons with this uh, variability index below 0 0.5. This means that this is the percentage of these country combinations that are denoting good model performance. So these are uh, uh, combinations of different models, and these bars represents the ones that are performing good. So as you see, we have these two different versions of this ensemble of models. So we are increasing. We have more combinations where models are, are doing good. But we still have an important percentage in some regions more than other where models are not doing that good. So we have a challenge in here. So we have been improving them in terms of parameterization, more complexity and spatial resolution, and, and that's what you see going from this red bar to the blue one. But we have still a lot of room to improve in our model, uh, in our class model. And then let's go to the other knowledge limitation that it's related to crop modeling. So we already know what's happening in terms of climate modeling. There, what's happening in terms of crop models that are limiting for food production impact, impact studies. 
So in here in this graph, what you say, see is in the vertical axis, you see the observed yield for maize, rice, and wheat for different simulations. And then in the horizontal axis, what you observe is simulated yield. And what I want you to focus is on these horizontal bars. These horizontal bars demonstrate the, the errors and are showing maximum and minimum simulated yields of this ensemble of models. So for instance, if you see in here, you see that this is a very big range in which we are going from 2.5 tons per hectare to almost 15. So a lot of uncertainties that are uh, mm, that are that you can see in these long uh, bars. So we still have to improve the quality of our crop models. Uh, obviously, this uh, depends on the crop system and geographically depends also on that. But again, we are observing limitations in terms of crop models. And then, obviously, if you put these deep uncertainties together you get bigger uncertainties or a cascade of uncertainties. And, sorry, and this is what you can observe in here in terms of the crop climate models. So crop climate models are still limiting food production impact studies. What you observe in this graph is for different countries, the simulation of wheat yields under a climate change scenario in which it has increased by three degrees Celsius. So for instance, if you think about India, what this model is suggesting is that the, the, the impact on yields could be from minus 13% to plus 13%. So not that many information in there. So, and again, it changes according to the different regions, but what you can observe in here is that we still have a lot of uncertainty in terms of our crop, crop climate models. What's another limitation in terms of assessing this impact on crop production? Well, what we have been observing is that we still uh, are lacking attention on, lice, on livestock, on fisheries, on pests and diseases, and on interactions, thinking, thinking about the food system. And this is very important if we think that, at least in terms of the livestock, demand will increase almost by 80% by 2050. If demand is going to increase and we don't know what's going to happen to livestock in terms of climate change, then we are in serious trouble. Thinking about fisheries, what's the problem in here? More than 1 billion poor people obtain most of their animal protein from fish. And then if we don't know what's going to happen to fisheries in a climate change scenario, again, we are in trouble. With respect to pests and diseases, some studies uh, suggest that they still reduce around 16% of global harvest and are very problematic in developing countries, then we need to start doing more research on pests and diseases. And here's a really interesting graph. This is coming from the food security chapter of the assessment report five that it's being uh, 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 developed by the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So it's this group of scientists that are like leading what's the scientific movement in terms of climate change. And so we, we start analyzing this chapter, the food security chapter. And then we quantify the numbers of citations according to these different topics. And as you can see, there's a real important bias towards a research that is being done around crops in terms of food security. You said not, you, you see not many in terms of livestock, fisheries, and even less in terms of pests and diseases. And the other uh, lack of attention has been given to crops, as I was saying, in terms of components of farming systems, value chains, or landscapes. And that's also something really important that we need to address. Thinking about the food security determinants, we have another uh, problem in here, and is that we are focusing very much, our research has been focusing very much on the availability dimension of food security and specifically on production. We did the same exercise. We went to the assessment report five from the IPCC. We went to the food security chapter 
and we divided this in the, in the, differ in the different dimensions of food security and we counted the number of cited papers according to these different citations. And again, what you observe is a big bias in terms of production, something little happening in terms of distribution, something in affordability, utilization, but on the other dimensions, nothing really happening in terms of studies that are addressing this, or at least the ones that are being cited in this chapter from the IPCC. Uh, and then, and then, so, this, this is very important if, if one thinks that uh, we need to start thinking about food systems from a different approach, specifically thinking about solutions that are coming from the demand side, and we certainly need more research on that. We particularly need to put attention on actions related to food waste and diets. And then also research that can help us to think about how should we deliver, how are we going to deliver good nutrition to individuals and households at not only secure sufficient available calories. So in terms of this knowledge limitation, and here we try to summarize in this cartoon what has been happening in terms of much analysis, a lot of uncertainties, but not much action happening. And this is what we have called the, this action paralysis. So basically this summarizes a little bit of frustration in terms of how uh, there are improvements in terms of knowledge. So models are becoming better. So important improvements, but less focus on solutions and implementation. And I think that this is the big challenge that we should think about. Thinking a little bit about the impacts of climate change on food security. So even though I have been in the past 20 minutes uh, telling you that there's a lot of uncertainties and knowledge limitations in terms of our modeling, still, I mean, despite all these uncertainties, what we observe is that on average, we are going to have redu reductions on, on global green, on crop yields in rice, maize, and wheat. And that's what you can observe in this graph. So in here, in the vertical axis, you have the yield change, and then you have the local temperature change. So as you see, um, wheat is more drastic, but what you are observing here is as the changes in temperature are, high, are higher than the yields are going down. In terms of... Um, in terms of quality, which is also a very important topic to address, what, what some studies have been suggesting is that we're going to see reductions in quality, and this is due to decreases in lead and grain nitrogen, decreases in protein and macro and micronutrient concentrations, and this is associated with increases in greenhouse gas concentrations. So therefore, the importance of also thinking about mitigation. And, uh, and then thinking about the impacts on livestock systems. Well, what research has been telling us is that this is going to be mediated through reduced feed quantity and quality for the livestock. So we are going to Im have impacts. And also from changes in pest and disease prevalence and direct impairment of production. And then thinking about access, what are the impacts of climate change in terms of affordability, functioning markets, and policies. And here we have a very interesting part in, in thinking about food prices and what's going to happen to food prices uh, in a world of climate change. So uh, there are different macroeconomic models and the results here, we have a lot of uncertainties as well, but this, the, the evidence suggests that uh, prices, food prices are going to increase uh, across different scenarios. And thinking about purchasing power of households, this is very important because affordability depends on that. And if you think, if you take into account that seven, almost 75% of very poor, poor people spend that percentage of their income on food, if these food prices are going to increase, then we're going to have serious problems in terms of purchasing power of these very, very poor household, if we are in a scenario in which food prices are increasing. A other very important thing, climate change is going to affect the geography of production at large scales. 
So probably places, countries where, for instance, coffee grows right now, it's not going to be the same story where we are thinking about increasing two degrees Celsius or three degrees Celsius. So that's going to change what is happening in terms of trade flow, and that's going to have an impact on affordability and functioning of markets. We're going to have impact on prices as well if these geography changes, and also in terms of food access. And again, thinking about how to move the food. Well, climate change is going also, it's going to have an impact of that. Uh, thinking about transport systems and physical well-being that can trigger, that can have problems in terms of moving this food. In terms of food quality, so what's happening with climate change and food quality? Well, what studies suggest is that climate change will reduce food safety because of higher rates of microbial growth at increased temperatures. So increasing, going high in terms of temperature, we are going to have more bacteria. And then uh, in terms of fisheries, this is very relevant. We're going to see, or what the study suggests, is that we will see rising disease incidence that will lead to overuse of pesticides and veterinary medicines, especially in fisheries. And then we could have a problem in fisheries. Uh, very important to consider, the effects of climate change on health will affect more people that are already poor, the more vulnerable people. So focus on that as well. So now, now that we have a panorama, what's, what are the knowledge limitations? What's happening in terms of the impacts of climate change and climate variability on food security? Then what are the challenges? And this is based on the work that we have been doing in CICAS, based on experiences that we have learned from our projects all around the world. So we have identified these four challenges into moving to an action agenda. Challenge number one. So we need to change the culture of research to focus on an action agenda. So we need to improve our models, we need to continue doing that, what, but we need to provide solutions from our science. And then what's happening here? Well, probably incentives are not the right ones or the most appropriate ones in, in order to go to this action agenda. In most research systems, require publication of papers are more important than solving problems and achieving outcomes. And that's something that we, we, we need to change. We need to, to give this, um, students that are working on their thesis and dissertations, we need to give them incentives so they are doing research that it's uh, solving problems and achieving outcomes. So that's something, a great challenge to think about. Uh, another thing, well, sometimes we, you could hear this argument in terms of, okay, climate change is going to happen in 40, 50, 100 years. Why working on this now? Well, Focusing on climate variability, and I think that we are all very, we know that we have had great problems in terms of extreme events, in terms of floods, in terms of droughts. So focusing on things that are happening right now and that are affecting people right now could be, uh, could help us to, to, to get in a less excuse for inaction due to uncertainty. So we are reducing that uncertainty by working on things that are happening right now, but we need to, we need to start working on those and to generate solutions. Uh, this also, this is a study from, uh, from, from the, this is the director of CICAS, and uh, uh, they have this interesting uh, way of, of, of implementing action-oriented research in terms of budgeting. So basically what they are promoting here is that whenever we are uh, going into, into this type of research, we should allocate the resources in, in three different thirds. So one third should go to needs. So really work with your users, the, the people that are going to use your research, the result of your research, and work with them in terms of understanding what are the needs. What are the questions that you are answering and that you need to solve. But you cannot do that as a scientist isolated. You need to get your users, either it could be 
policymakers, practitioners, help you to, to, to understand what is the right question that you want to solve with your, with your research. So one third of your budget should go into that process. Another third should go to research, well, we need your money to do your research, obviously. And then another third of your money should go to capacity building with the people that are going to use the results from your research. So that, some, th that has been proven to help us to, to really engage in this action-oriented research. And then just emphasizing the importance of these multi-stakeholder platforms as a really nice mechanism for engagement, for dialogue, and for coloring. So that, that can be really interesting in order to move to an action agenda. So what I'm going to show you now are some examples that from CCAPS have been using in terms of moving, um, going from our research into an action agenda. So throughout our regions in CCAPS, we have been working with this concept of climate smart villages. What are these climate smart villages? Basically, these are places, territories, in which we bring together global and locally relevant knowledge. We are thinking about climate smart agriculture, so we are thinking about adaptation, mitigation, food security, these are the three pillars. But in these territories, what we do is that we co-develop, we co-implement, we co-evaluate these different options of adaptation, mitigation, and food security with the communities. The communities are the heart of these processes. They are the ones that are driving these processes. They are the ones that know what they need, so we just combine these uh, research coming from the CGR centers, from CCAS, with the local knowledge. Could be we are working with indigenous people, with the farmers, so all the knowledge that it's there at the local level to develop and test these, uh, these options of climate smart agriculture. At the end of the day, what we want to generate is what we want to increase the resilience of the smallholder farming communities to a variable, variable, variable and changing climate. So this has been proven to, this has helped us a lot, as I was saying, to bring our science out from the, from the centers and then put it in the hands of the farmers and constructing a process with the farmers. Another example, this is also uh, around the Climate Smart Villages. These are components that are part of our Climate Smart Villages. And a very important part of, the, of this process that we do at the Climate Smart Village is to generate evidence so that these practices can be scaled up and out, so that many farmers can have access to these practices. Another way uh, that CCAPS has been trying to move its science into an action agenda. So this is a, we have this methodology of the scenarios, of constructing these scenarios, and they have been really useful in order to future-proof public and private planning. And we have been working with governments in terms of that, and in terms of this, and just let me give you an example of what we did with Costa Rica last year. So this is, a, this is the study case of Costa Rica. Uh, so basically last year, all of our countries were um, working on formulating their INDCs, their Intended National Determined Contributions, which were the ones that were presented uh, in Paris. So these are the commitments from the different countries of how they are going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and targets. So they are committing so, or putting over the table the targets. So the Costa Rican government was doing that last year with various stakeholders. And they were in a little bit of a problem because they, they, I mean, they had some models, but they didn't believe that the results of those models were helping them to set this target for mitigation in all the sectors of the economy. So we worked with them. We used the scenarios approach the people, the stakeholders, people from the government, from the private sector, they created four scenarios. They tested the reduction strategies within these scenarios, and then they decide what changes would be needed to really implement those targets in the Costa Rican economy. So through this methodology, methodology they were able to come up with a really robust INDC this is basically a policy document with date 
felt comfortable about the targets that they were committing in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Challenge number two. This is related to very much to prioritization. And basically, what we are saying here is that we should derive with stakeholders, so stakeholder-driven portfolios of options for farmers, communities, and countries. So we have limited resources. Resources are scarce. Therefore, it is very important to engage in prioritization of these actions in order to adapt, to mitigate, and to reduce food insecurity. So prioritization, it's very important, but this should be a stakeholder driven. So processes where stakeholders are a part of the process throughout the project. And then uh, this concept of portfolio, that's another thing that we have found very relevant. So when you go into the local level, it is very different if you implement just one action in terms of adapting to, to climate variability, for instance, that if you adopt two, three, or four actions probably related to capacity enhancement, climate services, etc. So the analysis in terms of portfolios, it's really important rather than analyzing action by action. And then uh, this, uh, this, this idea that usually when we go into the, the farm, we tend to focus on farm technical interventions, so the technologies that we want to implement. But portfolios, and this is very relevant, should also include services and programs to support these technologies. We have seen a huge problem in terms of implementation. So at some point we said, at the CGR we are generating all these technologies. Nobody is using these technologies. What's happening? So what's the good that we are doing? If we are generating all these science, but nobody's implementing them. Well, I think that part of the, 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 the answer to that problem is that we are not uh, investing enough in, on services and programs to support those technologies. And here it's a, a, an example of how we are, have been addressing through CCAS this uh, challenge, number two. And so we have been developing this uh, climate smart agriculture prioritization framework. This is a, a, a process you see that has several phases, four phases, and it's very participatory. So we include stakeholders, from, from different subsectors of the agricultural sector. And the idea is to, uh, to start with a long list of, of actions related to adaptation, mitigation, food security. And then throughout this process, with stakeholders, to narrow down this long list and then to construct portfolios that really can be implemented to address adaptation, to engage in mitigation, and to reduce food insecurity. So at the end of the day, you have, again, this concept of portfolios, which has been shown to be re very relevant. A prioritization where, for instance, and we did this with the government of Guatemala, the government, the Ministry of Agriculture, knew where to start, which package of actions was very interesting in terms of uh, in terms of economics, so we do a very robust analysis of cost benefit, including, including externalities, co-benefits, but also we do an analysis in terms of barriers for implementation and how to overcome those. Third challenge. This is related to gender and social differentiation. So basically, the message in here is that we have to make sure that adaptation actions are relevant to those most vulnerable to climate change. So, um, so, so in terms of gender, there are a lot of there are gender affects individuals in different ways, and this also affects the way that we implement, for instance, adaptation practices. So, uh, different individuals and families' exposure to risk varies varies according to gender. Also, their access to and control of resources, finance, land technology, and services, this is different according to gender and the different family roles. So there are new to tools that have been generated in order to understand this. And basically, what we are trying from CCAS side to do in here is to understand 
how by incorporating this gender perspective, we can make adaptation portfolios that have more success of being implemented. So just give me a, give, let me give you an example. In Bolivia, in Bolivia, men prioritize interventions such as irrigation, they like them more, while women prefer new crop varieties or diversified production. If we come into a, a, a territory and we want to implement an adaptation plan, we need to take that into account because if not, we are not going to get any results. So we have to understand what's happening in terms of gender, but not only thinking about women, what's happening in terms of youth, what's happening in terms of uh, all people in the communities. And the other important part of this story is that the options that we are um, that we are suggesting to implement, we need to make sure, and this is a pass that we have from the science, we need to make sure that we are not increasing inequalities because of these interventions that we are proposing at the local level. The fourth challenge, combining adaptation and mitigation while ensuring food security. And this is this concept of climate smart agriculture. So basically, if we want to close the emissions intensity gap, we need to increase production. And we already saw, looking at the numbers, that we will, we will need to, to feed more people. So there is no question about that. We need to increase production. Now the question is, how are we going to increase that production? So we should aim for, uh, for actions where we are increasing production but at the same time, we are decrease, decreasing emissions of greenhouse gases with the goal of having sustainable food systems that include climate goals. So, and, and, and this is possible because sometimes when you say that this is like the perfect world, and so somebody would say, this doesn't exist, this is not real. Well, it is, we need to do more research and generate more evidence on that, but this does exist. So basically, what we have to do is to uh, do uh, engage in more research around technical options that combine adaptation, mitigation, while ensuring food security. And again, the need to generate that evidence. And just I'm going to contribute to that by just giving you an example of this uh, technology in rice, which, ha which is called alternate wetting and drying. And this, this is a, a technology that has been used since the early uh, uh, 2000 for, for water saving. But, and, and this is an important thing that science has done, uh, science has found that this, met this technology also reduces methane emissions around 43%. So what we are observing, at least in this example, is a technology in which we are adapting because we are saving water. We're going to have problems in terms of water because of climate change. We are, also, we are already seeing this in terms of droughts. So we are adapting, we are contributing to food security, and then we are at the same time reducing greenhouse gas emissions. In Vietnam, this has been really successful because, the, I mean, obviously this depends on the place where you are implementing this. There are some places that you cannot implement that given the characteristics, but at least in Vietnam, this has been very successful, uh, and that's why this has been included, this, this type of technology has been included in the INDC of Vietnam, again, this intended national determined contributions in which uh, the, the country committed to reduce emissions to a specific target. They said we part of what of, of our plan to, to reduce those emissions is uh, using this technology. About 50,000 hectares of rye lands are now under this new technology with another 245,000 hectares having partial application. So to conclude, um, just this is my last slide. Um, three messages that I want to give after all this long talk. Um, it is clear, even though we have a lot of uncertainties, it is clear that climate impacts on food security will be serious, and we need to start working on that. Uh, 
Thus, the importance of advocating for more research, but not any kind of research. Again, research that can inform the actions needed to tackle food security challenge. Thinking about solving problems. Uh, food systems will need to transform because we have a big challenge. We need to feed more people. We have a lot of degraded lands. So they have to be transformed, but we identify these four challenges that we already uh, discussed in terms of focusing on an action agenda, in terms of deriving stakeholder-driven portfolios, taking into account gender and social differentiation, and combining adaptation mitigation while ensuring food security. And finally, uh, these are big challenges. I think that we all agree that these are big challenges. Science must work hand in hand with practitioners and policy makers. So we need to, and these spaces where, where we are all together, practitioners, people that science are very relevant to do this. And, and we have to devise options, taking into account three things. Options that meet current needs and capacities. So that's why it is very important to understand what are the needs and what are the capacities try our best bets and learn from our experiences. And um, you can, I mean, most of the things that I mentioned during this talk, you can find it in this paper that we published in Global Food Security. So you can have more examples, you can have more of the research that we have been doing in there. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>